Welcome to another web meetup of the Ayn Rand Center UK. So as you have probably noticed, every week the content is becoming better and better. And what a topic we have today and, and, uh, and what guests do we have today. So today we're discussing the, some questions around epistemology. So we're discussing the issue of rea the reactive subconscious. And we have with us Dr. Harry Binswager and Jim Moroni. So Harry is an objectivist philosopher. He's a member of the Ayn Rand Institute's board of directors. He is someone who has actually met and studied close to Ayn Rand. And he has also written many things. For me, the most important one is the book, How Do We Know? Which I think if objectivist was a martial art, this would definitely be on the test for the black belt. It's, it's, it's not easy, but it's, it's something which is very important. And also we have, as I said, Jean Moroni. So Jean is president of Thinking Directions, and she's giving ideas to businesses on how to think and execute more clearly. She's also a graduate from MIT and from the Objectivist Graduate Center. So you should tell us which of the two was more, more difficult. And they're both going to contribute to this. They're going to run this discussion. So there are going to be some opening remarks. And then you can ask your questions, again, either live by going to what it says participants and raising your hands, or by writing a question in the chat. Harry and Jim, thank you so much for being with us. Who wants to start? I'm going to start, but uh, some comments is really not what's happening. I'm going to blather <laughs> for a long time, and Gene is going to uh, enter and take part of it. And uh, the discussion part, I mean, maybe we got two hours, so there'll be time for discussion, but there's a lot of context setting that has to be done because this not only is, is our theory not really familiar to people, although it seems like total common sense to me. But I realized in talking about it, that people don't have the vocabulary to discuss consciousness at all. So that's where I want to begin. I want to sort out conscious, physical, vocal, fringe, and non-conscious. Consciousness is both of the term consciousness is used both for a faculty and for the state of awareness. And that in itself produces a lot of confusion, a lot of misplaced argument. It's the difference between the operation of a faculty and the faculty that operates. So for example, you could say production in the United States went up 10% last year, meaning there's 10% more product. Or you could say production in the United States is much less on the manufacturing side and more on the service side. Now, in there, you're talking about the, the process, right? So it's process and product. And then there's the apparatus of production productive capacity. Consciousness can be used for the um, first, uh, second two, that is for the operation of the faculty or the faculty. I think for products of consciousness, we don't tend to use the word conscious there. You, you would say conscious content, conscious objects, objects, facts you know, things like that. So the real issue is between the faculty and the operation of the faculty, um, the machinery and the moving parts when the machine, the running of the machinery, okay? The faculty of consciousness is uh, largely physical. I, I'm, I'm not trying to say it's, uh, you know, more than half, or, I don't think you can do it that way, but there's a lot of physical stuff to the faculty of consciousness, your brain, your nervous system, your spinal cord, probably, your eyeballs, your ears, uh, the 
sensors in your nose, sensory receptors. I don't know that you're, I guess your eyeball, but that's a, that would be a different, difficult thing to say, but certainly with the rods and cones in your retina or sensor receptors that are part of your faculty of consciousness. So there's no opposition between the physical and the faculty, the apparatus of awareness. But there is a big distinction between the state of awareness, conscious awareness, your thoughts, your feelings, your sights, the, what, you, what you hear, what you taste, uh, and the physical. Conscious awareness is not physical. It depends on the physical and it's of the physical. The world is physical. But it itself, your thought, your feeling, the pain you feel when you hit your thumb with the hammer, meaning to hit the nail, that's not physical. It has different attributes from the physical. It's not exactly clear what the physical is but it's distinguished from the conscious. Now, when I say it's not quite con uh, clear what the physical is, it's very hard to define what physical is. For instance, uh, is the um, electromagnetic magnetic field physical? Is your age physical? Is how much smarter you are than your brother-in-law physical? But it's clear that if anything isn't physical, and it isn't, something isn't physical, it's your pain, your love, your thoughts, the s s hearing of my sounds now, that is not reducible to any physical process. Depends on a physical process, but it is not itself physical. That's what we mean by the non-physical, the mental which of course doesn't mean supernatural or mystical because it is, a, uh, it is based on and an expression of, to use a very vague term, the physical. But it, it, it is not physical and it's important to remember that when you come to free will because free will pertains to the actions of consciousness, not to the faculty of consciousness. You choose as an act of consciousness, not, it's not a physical act. Your choice is not a physical thing. So Ayn Rand said to me once, as I put into the book, all the objections against free will come from taking choice to be non-conscious but physical. And that was very clarifying uh, to me. Okay, so that's the basic uh, starting point of the sorting out. The other part is that within conscious awareness, the action, not the mechanism, but the action of that mechanism, within conscious awareness, there are two levels. This is really a continuum, but we, we divide into two levels, focal awareness and fringe or peripheral awareness. I have one above the other with my hands because focal awareness is the higher thing. And it's just like with your eyes. If you don't move your eyes, but try to pay attention to what's on the left periphery, you see something, but not with much clarity. If it moves, you're pretty sensitive to that happening. And so you can turn your head, but it is not like something in foveal awareness. The fovea is the central part of your retina that has a very dense uh, array of sense receptors. And experientially, you don't need to know that this, this what's in the center of your vision, which you're directly looking at, that's the clearest, sharpest thing of all, right? There's the same thing in your mind what's in the center of your attention is very clear, but there are things going on that you're dimly aware of outside the center. That we call fringe awareness or peripheral awareness. Uh, Lee Pearson, who's uh, on the call, has stressed the importance of that 
for um, understanding free will. Because it isn't a binary choice, which you're directly aware of, and then all the rest where you blindly grab something. No, that's what you're clear about. And then what's a little bit less clear out of focus, and you bring it into awareness. You bring it into focal awareness. I'm sorry, it was already in awareness. But the big line is between things that don't even get to the fringe like uh, your thought of your 21st birthday or your knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem. All the things you know now that you did not know when you were born, only a tiny, tiny, tiny amount is in either focal or even fringe awareness. Then we get to the things that you're not aware of and can't be aware of that are outside of awareness. Uh, things like the regulation of your heartbeat, which the brain does, the autonomic uh, material or, or functionings of the nervous system, the, the, uh, how your sweat glands are activated when you get nervous or hot how your blood vessels constrict or expand according to various conditions. So you can't ever make that conscious, but your thoughts of your 21st birthday, if you can remember it, you can make conscious. And I'm sure everyone here is very conscious of the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> and if you're not, that's something I've been I've filled with diagrams to, to show you about. Because I'm working on the philosophy of mathematics and I'm kind of interested in that theorem in particular. So you get the distinction. There's what you're clearly aware of, what's in the center of your attention, what you're progressively less clear on but have some sense of, and then what's out of mind, and then what's never going to be in mind because it's physical, autonomic stuff that we don't even talk about. The subconscious is the stuff that's not in the periphery and not in focus. It's You're not aware of it, but it could be, loosely speaking, made conscious. That is, something could happen where what it has potentially is actualized and a thought occurs to you. A memory occurs to you. A feeling is uh, produced. So there are, um, the subconscious is the sum total of the contents of consciousness that you're not currently aware of. They're not in either fringe or focal awareness, but could become so. That you have access to, that you can activate, summon, that will occur to you. Okay, so that's the sorting out. I will take questions at this point because that's kind of important metaphysical background. So let's see if there are any questions about the metaphysics here. Oh, I should look at the um, participants. Can I ask you one question, first question, okay. Harry? What mm -hmm. if something is, let's say, was at some point in your consciousness, but is literally deleted. So it was so inconsequential. So not your 21st birthday, let's say the day after. So where does that, let's say, go? We don't know. There are two theories. One theory is it's in there, but you can't access it. The other theory is it wasn't uh, powerful enough to be retained. I have no opinion, but there's this um, neuroscientist from the 30s, Wilder Penfield, who put electrodes on the brain of patients he was operating on for other things and gave a mild excitation of uh, electrical, because the brain functions electrically. And people 
were had experience. Oh, I'm back in my parents' house and it's raining and I can see my brother who I haven't seen in 30. I'm reliving that now. It has not been verified to my knowledge that that isn't imagination rather than recollection. But the theory at the time was, oh, then all that material is in there. Everything is on the tape. But you can only get out that which you can get to, and that's a small percentage of that. Uh, so the other theory is, no, you have to have, you have to care about it enough for it to be engraved in the structure uh, that gives you the capacity to re-experience it. And Harry, the, yes. the definition you gave also addresses this in the sense that we're, we're this is an abstraction, right? We've observed that there are some things that you can bring into awareness and we've observed that you know you have some memories and the 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 definition you've given is based on what we observe not some theory about how it gets stored or anything like that we've seen this phenomenon and this is what we're talking about we're talking about content that is not in awareness but could be brought into awareness whatever that is yeah and to to make a point that lee likes to make the thing that's not in awareness, although we tend to speak otherwise, the thing that's not in awareness is not a piece of awareness. So for instance, if you can picture the image of uh, the moon, full moon, picture a full moon in your mind. Okay, that's not imagining, you're, you're sort of remembering uh, anything else that you, like uh, uh, your, your car. Okay, so you remember what it looks like, you formed that image. It's not that a little image of the moon or your car was floating around somewhere beneath the surface of awareness. Rather, there was some physical encoding of, the, uh, of that information that is able to be activated so that it's produced it again. And scientists now think not produced with a lot of fidelity. It's possible to kind of fudge it or to simply leave a lot out. I won't go into that interesting experiment. So um, don't make the mistake, because that's, that's our whole theory, what's coming up now. Don't make the mistake of thinking there's a little man in you who's thinking all the thoughts you could have, but are not currently having. Who's remembering, who's now experiencing the millions of memories you have and will send one up to you uh, if he's prodded. No, what's out of awareness is physical. What's out of awareness is physical. And you have the, the subconscious is not the physical stuff. The subconscious is the capacity for what's encoded physically to reproduce in consciousness certain content that you uh, had before, plus new uh, content that we'll get to in a second. And by physical, you mean not conscious, like the how your blood, let's say, circulates. No, I mean like neurons, axons, dendrites, and synapses. Right. And whatever else. I mean, there's one theory that the DNA is changed when you have uh, uh, memories. The DNA stores the memories. I, I don't know if that's true. I doubt it. But um, something physical has changed in such a way that you can recall an experience it's like, you know, a tape or a hard drive. The subconscious is not the, um, the physical stuff. It's the capacity, you know, Aristotle has this very important category of the potential. And that's why abortion is not murder. A potential is not an actual. The Subconscious is the potential for uh, the capacity to re-experience 
or have things occur to you. Because we, um, the, the observation that we have is that there are things that we know that are not in our awareness. Like I said, the Pythagorean theorem or your, what your car looks like, they weren't in your awareness. But once you dig them out, you know, do certain things with your conscious mind, they come to awareness. The example I actually gave in my first lecture was Mary had a little lamb came to all your consciousnesses, unless you're really from a different culture. Maybe some of you are. But in the Anglo-Saxon world, that's a nursery rhyme that every child grows up with. So uh, where was it? Why did we all have that? You didn't have it when you were born. It got stored. Right, and what gets stored is some something that is not itself a word or a thought or a sound, but something that can produce that. Okay. Uh, hey, you mentioned Lee. Shall we take a live question from Lee because he he has his hand up? Oh, he does. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Lee. Oh, you're muted for some reason. No, now he's unmuted. We're not hearing him. Lee, I can't hear you. All right, we'll go on. Okay, you'll fix it. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I'd like to get to the theory. All right, let's move on to the theory. Those of you who have asked questions, don't worry. We'll address them sooner or later. If not in this life, in the life to come. <laughs> So what is our theory? What is it? It, it? Our theory is that the subconscious is reactive, not active. Reactive is not the perfect word, but there's a lot of theories and Ayn Rand was attracted to these and I, her language suggests that she agreed with them. It's not 100% clear that she disagrees would disagree with what I'm saying, but there's a big question raised about whether I'm disagreeing, Gene and I are disagreeing with Ayn Rand, but it's not in philosophy, it's in psychology. Uh, there are a lot of theories that say things germinate in the subconscious. You, you try to remember a name and you go about your business and two hours, a day later, that name comes into your mind. Reardon and Atlas Shrugged got the idea for the uh, truss and the arch being combined in a way that solved the problem of how best to use Reardon metal for a bridge. And it's very much presented as what she calls a subconscious integration. You could interpret and in my view misinterpret that to me there are little robots in the brain in the subconscious that go around looking for the answers to questions like web crawlers that go indexing things that go out looking for the answers to questions or potential answers and when they find one they send it into awareness now everybody who holds this view acknowledges it can be wrong. It's not the word of God. I had one this morning. One of these subconscious integrations. But we're going to say that that is not due to any kind of active process going on while you're not using your subconscious. Uh, this morning, I was working on the Pythagorean theorem last night on proofs of it to try to make it more uh, intuitive and commonsensical rather than the abstruse proof that the, exists. And I woke up thinking, use three dimensions. That didn't pan out. I thought it was a brilliant thing, but it didn't pan, pan out. But, but being interested in this, I thought about how it came to me. I didn't wake up thinking that. I went through a shadowy, half asleep, half awake state where that came into my mind. So I was awake 
but not fully and not running my mind. I was just coasting. You know, that kind of, it's, it's like all your awareness is fringe awareness before you really, I'm not sure that's accurate, but it's something different than directed cognitive focus of the week. But uh, basically, all the, the normal things that happen, like emotions and new thoughts that you have, the, they don't have to be combining the trust and the arch. Just, hey, why don't we have Indian for dinner? We haven't had that for a long time. It can be as mundane as that. All of those things come about through a process of connections implicit in the structure of the information that you've filed, that you've stored. So plus what, there, plus what the stimulation is, right? Plus whatever is going on at the time in the world and in you. Yeah. That in conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have a diagram. Is this the time for the diagram? No. One second. The things that you can do with your mind, with your conscious ego, are you can judge things, yes or no. You can file things, you can store things by seeing something clearly and deciding it, judging that it's important. And you can recall things by querying your database. What was the name of my third uh, grade teacher? Uh, I think it began with a B. Let me try B, A, B, 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 B. No, uh, let me pic picture her. She had this one. And eventually Edwards came to me, it was Mrs. Edwards. So you can engage in a process of seeking for the right connection that will allow you to access that information. So you think of it as putting things down into memory, bringing them up from memory for a purpose. And judging, is it true? Is it false? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it important? Is it trivial? I think those are the three, um, three axes of judgment that you can perform. I'm going to, in a minute, let Jean talk about the values, but I want to kind of pull this together with a diagram. And those of you who are not on video on Zoom will have problems. So I make the conscious ego, the volitional faculty, in, by analogy, into a magnet. And the magnet is directed over the network of your knowledge. And I've got a whole lot of little dots for nodes and little lines to connect them. It's like a net, a complex net. Not all the, it's not, you know, as regular as a net, a fishing net. There are lines that go way down and lines that only go a short distance uh, uh, connections. As you, as something gets pulled up, it pulls up other things that are closely related to it. First into the periphery. If they get close enough, if they're pulled up strongly enough, they reach focal awareness. So I've got real near the magnet on the top, focal awareness, and I've got two, about two things in there. And then I got about six things in fringe awareness, which does not relate to the crow. The crow is for focal awareness. Uh, and below them, there are, of course, hundreds of thousands or millions of nodes for the full context of your knowledge, i.e. everything you know now that you didn't know at age zero. That's quite a lot. So you can move this magnet according you say, oh, 
this looks promising over here. Let me turn the magnet over here. Then it will pull up what's on that side. Or you can say, no, I don't want to know about that. Or I want to know about this thing over here. You turn the magnet the other way, and that starts to pull up a different set of information. It's all about activation. You have the power with your volition to energize connections, to, to energize a, an area of, of, of items that were subconscious and make them conscious. And then you get other material by what's connected to that. And you can energize them. Say, oh, speaking of energy, how about mobile oil? Does that still exist? And what about mobile and mobile? Do they have any connection? You can go any way. You know, that's not a logical way. But you can go any way that your values, your goals, uh, um, energy it gives the energy to go. But you control what the focus of your retrieval is. Now, because things are in a network, you don't just pull up isolated facts. What's the capital of Virginia, Richmond? You don't just pull up that. You pull up, oh, Richmond, they're, they're tearing down the statues on Monument Avenue now. What's my view of that? Well, that has to do with the Civil War and racism and slavery. What do I think about racism? Uh, well, didn't Ayn Rand say it's a form of collectivism? So you see how you, your thought, if you're logical and you have a purpose, can proceed from an accidental thing, Virginia Capitals, Richmond, which is boring, to value issues that you're interested in in a process of thought, which will bring up new connections. So new ideas will occur to you because you are pulling up, activating, facts that are attached to facts that are attached to facts where you've never put the three together. So you, you filed, you attached A to B, right? Like uh, Richmond pulling down Civil War statues. You attached B to C, pulling down statues because it's claimed they're racist. You attach C to D. Racism is a form of collectivism. But you've never connected Richmond to collectivism before. But now you can see, oh, there's a tide of collectivism. They call it anti-racism, but it's really racism. Or maybe you think it isn't right. Maybe you think it's anti-racism. And you say there's a tide of anti-collectivism hitting Richmond. It doesn't matter what conclusion you draw. You see how you've never put those two thoughts together, Richmond and collectivism, one way or the other. But because of the way things are connected to each other and the purpose of your thinking, you will get new ideas, new connections will be made because of the structure, because of the structure. Whereas, for example, you would not go from, I would not go, from Richmond to Marshmallow. I have no particular connection of Richmond and Marshmallow, even though I'm from Richmond. So I deliberately was able to pick something that does not have a connection, as opposed to Richmond statue, statue racism, racism, collectivism, all those are very strongly connected. Marshmallow, Marshmallow sticky. Richmond sticky? No, I, that is not going to occur to me. So the structure, the thing that Ayn Rand calls subconscious integration is reaping the rewards of a structure that produces novel and creative and fertile connections. Novel, fertile connections. That's creative thinking because the potential to make them is in how you filed the information to begin with. And file is her term. And she often talked about filing information. Can I add something to that, Harry? Yeah, I think that's about time to take a little pause. 
So can I add something? I, I want to add Please. on a couple of things to what you said. So you were focusing mostly on just how you control what comes up by your volitional attention. And you were focusing on it. And that obviously that's, you can, there's a point Lee makes also, that you, the thing that you turn your attention to is something that is already in the fringes of awareness. And that's how you can follow these leads. But I just want to point out that that what is activating things from the subconscious is not just your turning your focal attention. There's also all sense data, right? So if you are, if, if your eyes are open and your ears are not, you know, closed off, you, you are getting input and that is going to have an impact as to what gets activated. And there is some evidence, and this is based on, this is basically the activation theory of memory, which is, I got when I was at Carnegie Mellon, uh, uh, pretty uh, there were a lot of people who believed it at that time i think it's still pretty well uh widespread agreed and that the activation could actually happen to some degree before it gets to the fringes of awareness so you can actually have things that are in the subconscious that are somewhat activated but not even in the fringes of awareness and yet that is going to affect whether they can pop up into the fringes of awareness yeah they're the the nodes here that are just below Right. that are connected. They have a lot of connections to things in awareness. Right. And, and the way I think about it is that when you activate one thing, anything related to it moves up in its activation level, but you have to be above some threshold to be in focal right. awareness and then some lower threshold to be in fringe of awareness. But you can also have some activation and not be in awareness at all. And so can I, I add an important. element to this question that we got from Facebook, actually, from a friend of Facebook? He says, what is the process like when things like music, or I would say even a smell, evokes memories in the subconscious and can even make you remember things you maybe thought you forgot. Right. right. So how does this function in physical slash mental reality? Well, well I think, I, I guess I'm not sure what the question is. I mean, it triggers if it's, if so actually, let me get let to me, the next let me point. Let say that, Gene. It's a values issue. Mm -hmm. There's a phenomenon called triggering, yeah. which is the clear awareness of A adds energy to everything that's connected to it. And things that are very strongly connected to it will pop into, be dragged into awareness or from fringe awareness into focal awareness. That's what you were talking about. Or from out of awareness to near the fringe or... So whatever is in awareness have in a this probability of coming into awareness and that is increased by the amount of connections that are triggered by what's in awareness that are attached to them. So the things that easily come into awareness, uh, like uh, if I say uh, Hank Reardon, the sanction of the victim, the men of the mind on strike, uh, we're going back to the earth, or the first of their return. Atlas Shrugged is in everybody's mind, I hope. Because there's so many, I, I didn't say Atlas Shrugged, but there's so many uh, uh, connections to, that, to what is in awareness that it can't not be in awareness. Mary had a little, you know, two and five is... Seven. You just can't not hear seven. It's been triggered. It's been triggered. Thank you, Gene. Um, so, so let me add one other thing yeah. on that, because this is really important. So what your attention is on will trigger, will activate, add activation. What comes in from sensory awareness will add activation. And the third and critical thing is goals that you are holding in mind. And I think this is really, really essential for understanding weird aha moments is that you've been holding that goal in mind. And in some way you are keeping it in awareness there's like there's like an effort that's involved when you set an intention and hold a goal in mind so like if you are working very purposefully on a topic you that takes mental work to keep focused on what it is you're trying to do and make judgments repeatedly about whether something is relevant or not and that goal by virtue of having been kept in conscious awareness is now constantly activating anything related to it I think that that is another reason why just time on task can often make a difference in whether you uh, solve a problem is that you are holding that goal in mind and everything that comes up is being activated plus the goal. So anything that connects the goal with any 
random ideas that come up is actually going to also get activated over time. Was, was that clear, Harry? Yeah, I think okay. so. Uh, so. The factors that increase the strength of the connection, the strength of the connection means how much, between A and B, means how much a given intense focus on A tends to bring B to mind or N to mind to make it for the The strength of the connection is a function of the factors of repetition, how often the A, B, or A, N connection has been made to you, for you and your, in your experience, uh, how emotionally important, how value connected it is, how recently A and N have been in your mind together and seen as connected, and what is the other factor that I've forgotten? The things that tend to make you remember something. It's right. well known. Importance, emotions, recency, re repetition. Number of links. Number of links yeah. to it. If there are, if if A attaches to B and C, and they attach, C attaches to N, and A attaches to K and X, and X attaches to N, and A attaches to P, and P attaches to N, you're much more likely on a being triggered, A being in consciousness to pull up N than if there were just one such link. If you cut all the, or had not formed all the links, but, but one, the more associations you can form to something, the more likely you are to remember it. So Harry, Shall can we, we also, or Nikos, did you want to ask a question? Because there's no, I, I was suggesting if we should give Lee another chance to ask his question, but go, go ahead, Jim, you can ask your question first. So there's just one thing that I think maybe we need to say to, to package this up, which is how important values and concepts are in the structure, because what you were just describing, Harry, is more like the association type connection. But I think values and concepts really structure the information in the subconscious in a way that's important and radically affects how you pull things up. Now, Harry, you're muted. I think I have a bell going off. Is, are other people yeah, hearing that bell? Yes. I, I, I believe that's a Skype call, which I don't expect to get. Uh, it's anyway, it's gone. Um, yeah, let's let Lee uh, come in from uh, his vantage point. Go ahead, Lee. You're unmuted. Okay, you. thanks. Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, Harry, this is the best presentation of this subject I've ever heard you give, this uh, presentation. And I, I, I came here loaded for bear because I was, you know, but now I've got to shoot a rabbit. Because uh, <laughs> I don't have, because you brought in, because you've stressed very strongly that judging and filing and uh, some other stuff was, was volitional. The, the really the importance, and that's been my main disagreement, is uh, in my, my opinion, the, the whole, the big difference between conscious and subconscious, the, the difference that counts is volition. So that, that leaves me with one relatively small thing to disagree with. Um, I, I posted on the list, and, and you agreed with me. I said, all conscious experiences are approximately caused by neural processes. All conscious experiences are approximately caused. And you gave that an enthusiastic endorsement on the list. You said, I suppose so. So yes. I, knew, I guess you uh, somewhat. Doesn't somewhat get better than that, right. Doesn't get better than that. So now that means that all connections that are supposedly made by consciousness are actually made by neural processes. All of those connections. So when you, James shaking her head, but so when you say clear awareness adds energy, this is something I strongly disagree with. You have the causality exactly backwards. It is the neural processes that create the clear awareness. The, the, the clearness and the awareness and the feeling of clearness, all of that stuff is created by neural processes first. So at the same time that it creates the clear awareness, it also, I, this is my third theory, uh, Nikos, when you answered Nikos, you gave two theories of the memory 
of, of how memory works, I've got a third theory. And that is that when the conscious experience is, is created at that time, the memory trace is laid down. So when a clear awareness, a strong awareness is created, a strong memory trace is laid down at that time. Yeah, and but you think it's the brain. The, you think it's the brain that that, that is... Um... Yes, it's the brain. You don't see a link going through the, the awareness itself. You think it's no, zombie. Not, not, a, not at all, because the, the because neural processes create all all conscious awareness. Neural yeah. processes, including the cl clarity, the clearness, the strength, it's already been created by, by neural processes. And, they, and at that time, at that time, a, a trace is laid down. And then when the neural, uh, the, you have the conscious experience and it disappears out of consciousness, it doesn't go anywhere. It just disappears. It doesn't create anything and it doesn't become anything. It doesn't go into another storehouse of subconscious memories. When you, when something yeah. goes out of your consciousness, it simply disappears. And the, the memory trace has already been laid down. There is no need to appeal yeah. to yeah. any effect. So the, the causal let's... effect of... Let's uh, do the, first of all, the little scientific amendment. Um, your theory should be that the, the precursor of the laying down, because they think that the you know, short-term memory gets laid down in sleep as long-term memory. So you're saying the, the precursor trace for the big trace, right? Okay, that, that's, that's correct. It doesn't change the metaphysics, yeah. It doesn't, say, doesn't change anything about it, yeah, yeah. right? That doesn't change anything. Yeah, it's already, the point is that the, the physical potential that's laid down has been laid down while the conscious experience is created at the same time. Uh, so I think there it's isn't any, practically at the same time, but uh, I don't think the causality has to be after the fact. In other words, the, the, the clear awareness is what lays it down. And no, I, I'm, I'm denying that. I'm saying it's exactly that. I know you are. You're a materialist. It, it's, you're a materialist. No, I'm not, no, no, no. I'm a materialist about material. Of course, we're all materialists mostly because, uh, let's face it, the world is mostly material. Most of the world is material. The part that, the, the, the part that is absolutely not material, and this is the key thing that we've agreed on forever and, and can, shall continue to agree on is volition. Volition, yeah. The fact that, yeah, volition is not a material uh, process and uh, it has all the effects that you listed are the effects of volition. By the way, I, I do want to recommend something uh, regarding the magnetic uh, me metaphor. It's not bad, but I actually think the better one that's more in line with the neurology is if you investigate what Ber the psychologist, neuropsychologist Bernard Bars, B A A R S, has to say about what he calls the global workspace. Because the global workspace is a is is conceived of as a neural. It's not necessarily a structure. It's a functional unit in the brain that connects up to all other parts of the brain that it can and draws stuff from it in the way that you were describing, more or less. Mm -hmm. The only problem with Bernard bars is that he doesn't he he hates volition yeah i mean he hates free he hates free will he's okay yeah. with volition as a as non-free but he hates free will so that you know destroys his theory as a theory of consciousness but as a theory of the uh, as, as a description of the underlying neural processes it's pretty it's pretty good and i do recommend looking into yeah, it i i i you've recommended him and i have not read him but uh i'm i'm interested in doing so yeah, the, um, G, G wants to tell me I'm totally wrong here, so let's... Uh, I but think no, but disagree. I get to tell you. I get to, <laughs> uh, G, oh, okay. G and I agree that volition is the ruling element, and it cannot be erased or reduced to matter. Uh, where we disagree is that I think volition is a description of... Um, conceptual consciousness and does not apply. Uh, there is another thing, consciousness, which is not material, and animals have it, and they don't have free will. Now, interestingly, Lee thinks that animals do have free will because he sees a little bit, just a, a little, little bit. 
A consciousness yeah. and free will is coextensive. I see, and Ayn Rand also saw volition as a small area within consciousness. Gene, Gene, that's your cue. That's my cue. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think we just disagree here because the fact that there is a, we think that we assume that there's a brain component to conscious action doesn't mean that we think it's that uh, basically that consciousness is an epiphenomenon, which is basically what I think Lee is saying. No, but I didn't say that. I didn't, well, but, it's, no, but essentially exactly, you're saying entire, it's not the it, causal factor. A, but I think we should go state. on. Yeah, yeah I think Karen just suggests yes, that wrong. maybe some of our participants are not 100% able to follow this disagreement, okay. although I'm sure it's very interesting. So, uh, Harry, do you want to go on, or shall we take a couple of more questions? I'm going to take question? a couple of chat questions. Ashley Roy says, is genius, literal genius, largely a function of how many connections you can make and how many levels you can make them at, and your facility for dealing with them purposefully, productively? I would say we don't know. And I think... Um, more important is the, the difference between very intelligent, successful people, short of genius, and genius is something that comes around at most once a century and probably most uh, once or twice a millennium. Uh, the difference that we, that we are, is within our um, purview, you know, not the super extraordinary, is the issue of how much you try and how long you tried as a child. People who have active minds, who use their volition and free will to try to make everything as clear as they can from age two, end up being very effective, intelligent seeming people. People who just, or like most people let things waft through their consciousness. Oh, look at that. And then look at that. Do not grow up to be uh, intelligent seeming people. That's my understanding. Uh, there may be a genetic component too, but my, my view is that the, um, the difference in genetics is like the difference between a a Honda Accord and a Maserati, but the difference you observe on, about cars on the street are those that have their ignition switched off and are coasting, or which are stuck in first gear, and those that use the entire potentiality uh, of the car. It doesn't fully hold up. A better one is a muscle analogy um, that... Uh, Yes, there's probably a difference between the musculature attainable by the person with the best genes for getting muscle and the average person, okay? But the difference between Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was pumping iron and me has more to do with the workouts that he did. It's the training, the work. The, the building up of muscles, not some theoretical upper genetic limit that is responsible for the difference in strength among people that you observe. And I think it's even more true in, uh, with the mind because psychoepistemology enters in there. The guy who works to make things clear straightens out his mental equipment more than the guy who doesn't. Now, there's also the issue of education. If you were educated before 1960, you probably have a lot better psychopistemology, uh, the average, no, let me not say you. Statistically, the average person who was educated before 1960, who got through at least grade school, graduated from grade school before 1960, hey, that leaves me out. You got through grade school by 1960. Oh, yeah, before 19. Yeah, school. that's right. That's right. Is going to be a lot. It's a lot easier for him to have a good psychopistemology. And on average, they will have a better psychopistemology than the people later. 
And, and America is going to be worse than England. And England is probably worse than maybe Germany. I don't know where the progressive education, the touchy-feely dogmas have infiltrated less. But I see a big difference between the UK and America in that regard, and it's to the UK's advantage, since I'm speaking to London people. Can I add something on that? Because this, there was a question somewhere there about, can you have subconscious overload? Is there a crow for the mm. subconscious? And this is related to this. I, I mentioned that the organization, the structure of the subconscious depends very much on values and concepts. And it's the logical organization is your conceptual organization. Have you essentialized your knowledge and do you have it all organized in terms of fundamentals? If you do that, in effect, what comes up from your subconscious is very essentialized. It's, it's very pointed. It's very specific things. And you won't have, you'll have the most relevant things come up because all of your knowledge is organized in terms of fundamentals. And similarly with values, if you have worked hard, if you have a very clear central purpose and you have worked very hard to figure out what your top values are and to prioritize and to, which is something that the actions that you take program your values and program the strength of values uh, and things that are value laden will pop into awareness much more easily. If you have a very organized value hierarchy, a very pointy, highly structured value hierarchy, again, fewer things will occur to you because of the structure of your subconscious. And so if you look at like epical geniuses, they're geniuses in a, in a I mean, actually Ayn Rand may be the exception actually, but I'm thinking of like Einstein. He's a genius in a very narrow area and he has that kind of knowledge, very, very highly structured and it's of high value to him. And those two things have come together to make his mind extremely organized. Plus oh. there's evidence he had some genetic, you know, he had, he had a small brain. That was actually something they noticed when they autopsied him. But big so, blood vessels. Okay, lots of oxygen to his uh, brain. I can, I can see something else to support that. Um, Ayn Rand and I played Scrabble. We played it, I don't know, maybe 50 times. She was not better than me at Scrabble. Scrabble's a word game, if you don't know about it, where you try to arrange tiles with letters on them in a kind of crossword-like pattern. She was good, I'm good, but couldn't hold the candle to Rachel Knapp. Rachel Knapp is someone who uh, work, is an objectivist, worked for the Ayn Rand Institute. And Rachel's fanatically interested in Scrabble. I played a game online with Rachel, and I quit after three moves, because after th normally a game is about 15 moves. After three moves, she was where I hoped to be at the end of the game. Her score was already in the 300s which is usually enough to win a game. So I just stopped playing. I could not compete with her. People who uh, are Scrabble geniuses. Oh, uh, here, I'll give you the, the, the reason. I asked Rachel once, have you memorized all the three letter words? Because I had memorized all the two letter words. You really need to know those two letter words. Have you memorized all the three letter words? And she said, yes and all the four letter words, and all the five letter words, and all the seven letter words. You don't want to play a six letter word for various reasons. All the seven letter words. And since then, I think she's gone on to the eight letter words, um, maybe beyond. So it's no mystery why she would be able to uh, beat anyone. It's there's what you've stored, what you care about, and what time you've spent on task and how you stocked your subconscious. So um, that is uh, an anecdote to, to, to say the genius is not some kind of mutation that makes the mind good in everything, you know, without practice and, and motivation. Okay, um, Jean, I think um, we should go on to um, some of the big points, one of them being yours. My next little point 
uh, a short point, but huge point is, where do we come off saying this? You know, people ask, well, where do you, and the, this is the theory that there are no connections made by the subconscious that are not the direct result of what was in the conscious mind. The subconscious does not go out and make connections on its own. And there's one big answer and one little answer to where to, what's the evidence for our theory? The big answer is it's the simplest theory to postulate a process beyond what we have talked about you would need to have specific evidence. You would need to have things that the simpler hypothesis cannot account for. And the people really don't. They, they think, oh, well, the sudden inspiration, but we can explain that. And even if you wanted to include, even if we couldn't explain, you know, uh, the truss in the arch, that's rare enough that we could say, okay, that's like the RH factor. It's a complication, a derivative little thing that sometimes happens to some people. But basically what we say is how you function day to day all the time. It would not refute us. And there is no evidence for a little man in the brain going out and finding things for you and doing things for you that actually a brain couldn't do, that a consciousness would have to do. That's the big argument, that it's arbitrary to assert a process where, I think that's my, let's stop, okay. It's arbitrary to assert a factor that is not, that's an extra factor that's not necessary to explain what's going on. I mean, we know from my examples, like Mary had a little lamb, we know that consciousness does respond to uh, triggers of associated content that it's learned in the past. We know that repeating over and over and over again something tends to fix it in your memory. That it's not a hypothesis there, but that there are processes you don't know about that are going out making connections for you, you need extra evidence for that. It's arbitrary without extra evidence. The other, um, the other uh, smaller thing is the, uh, that it integrates, our theory integrates well with everything. And it seems like that any other theory would have to posit a non-conscious consciousness, would have to posit a separate self in the brain that can judge things. Because you can't say, well, we've got the brain, we've got this computer in there and, and it's stored memory. And then there's this little entity that goes out while you sleep and looks for relevant things to bring into your mind. So when you wake up, it's, got, it's gone and looked at all the other neurons and said, oh, this is a good neuron to bring in. It can't do that. Neurons can't decide that other neurons store relevant helpful or whatever information it's it's just a question of how well attached they are it's electrical electrochemical it's not logical and that's the difference between the physical and the psychological like uh what was my what did i say about richmond um uh i'm gonna take an accidental so association richmond and marshmallows uh, that was really accidental uh, yeah, but that's not an association. I have in my mind the association Richmond, Rochmond, because that's how the real Richmonders pronounce it, Rochmond. And I've told that to so many people so many times. And when I hear Richmond and focus on the word, I hear Rochmond in my mind. And uh, that is not due to anything other than sheer repetition. Well, Mary had a little, or a seven times three. How do you know that? It's not because of some subconscious integration. It's been repeated over and over. You saw it intellectually at some point, perhaps, or maybe not. Maybe uh, 
30 days has September, April, June, and November. How do you know the next word? Because of repetition. So we know that there's association and it, it can explain everything uh, if you understand the whole system that we said. Okay, so uh, Jean, did you want to talk about the practical, I hope you do, practical yeah. applications? Yeah, so the one of the things that, I, mean, I basically learned this from Harry in his psychoepistemology lectures and then used it and expanded upon it in teaching thinking skills. And uh, a lot of the, what I would say the application of this whole theory is concerns holding context and making judgments in the context. And so I just want to say a few words about that. For the first thing, this is something that we haven't talked about, but I, I want to make sure it's clear. When you make a judgment that something is good or something is true, you are doing that in the context that is presently activated. This I'm going to say this based on our theory, right? So for example, if you say someone asks you, would you like to have dinner Friday night? And you're not currently remembering anything you've done Friday night. You don't think there's anything on the agenda and you are, uh, want to have, you'd like to do that. You might say yes. And then you go look at your calendar. This has happened to me. I've looked at my calendar and realized I'm going to be in another city. It's true. I don't have anything on the calendar Friday night, but I'm going to be in another city. I can't have dinner Friday night. And the point there is I got a yes in a context that did not include the full context of knowledge that I needed in order to make that judgment. And of course, the number one error in logic is dropping context. You need to hold the full context to reach a conclusion. And what this theory of the subconscious, of the reactive subconscious, really fits in with the idea that you need to activate the appropriate context. And you need to do that so that your judgment is objective, basically. So just um, three cases where this comes up when you're dealing with motivation. I think these are the easiest cases to understand. The cases went, and I, I talk a lot about productivity, so it's, it's like in my class on do what matters most. Uh, there are times when you know exactly what you should be doing and you just don't feel like doing it, right? What do you do in that situation? Well, what you need to do is you need to actually activate the value context. You have to remind yourself about what are the values at stake and use those values to activate the motivation which will get you to want to do it. And that's you know, overcoming inertia. This is there's a definite process for doing that that involves saying, well, I, I thought I was supposed to do this. There must have been some reason. What was the reason? What was the value? When you get in touch with the values, you also then activate all the emotions around that and your other knowledge of, about that sort of thing. Uh, the, there are basically three basic motivational problems. You know what you want to do, but you don't feel like it. You uh, know what you sh should be doing, but you feel like doing something else. You're tempted off it. So this sometimes like you're going down the slippery slope and you keep doing something because it just, uh, it has a lot of motivation behind it. And, but you don't think it's the right thing. Well, what do you do in that situation? Again, you need what, to be able what to- What was that one? What, what was number two? First was you don't feel like doing it. The second right, was what? Which is inertia. This is the case of temptation where something is- so you, you are, feel like doing are, something else. else. You feel like doing something else, right? And again, what you actually need to do here is to activate the full context of values. The basic solution here is to give contra give both sides a fair hearing, give the contrary motivation a fair hearing because part of you thinks you should be doing this, part of you wants to be doing that. And uh, uh, what you need to do is you need to actually activate all of that information and then get the values out and make a judgment which value is more important in this context. Sometimes the thing you're tempted to do turns out to be more important. Sometimes it's not, but the way that you solve this problem is by activating the full context, using the kinds of things that we've been talking about. And then the third case is the case of resistance where you have an aversion to do the thing that you think you should be doing. And this is a somewhat different case because, uh, uh, well, first of all, you still need to give contrary motivation a fair hearing, but what can happen in this case, th this is actually a little bit off topic. When you feel a tremendous aversion to do something that you think is good for you, it means that there's something else going on that somehow you have filed this thing as also bad for you. And that means that there's additional analysis that needs to be undertaken. And the way you do that, the way you do that analysis is by again, introspecting, why do I think this would be bad for me? What is the bad thing that I think would happen? 
you feel aversion to something that if you if you take the step you think it's going to be bad for you well what is that and where is the logical error there it's by pulling up the um pulling up the things that are connected to the feelings that you're having that you can eventually untangle and find there's a contradiction somewhere if you think what uh, you're going kind of fast i wanted Sorry. to kind of chunk it out for people good um, people um one alternative to the reactive subconscious is a passive subconscious that well my subconscious is making me feel bad today my subconscious if you were to use that language <laughs> I don't feel like doing this or I, I'll do that, but I really want to do this other thing. This is, this is, you know, and that's it. I feel it. Okay. And the third is, Oh God, I don't want to do that. I know I should, but I don't want to do that. And the passive view is there's a little something in you that gives you these feelings and that's it. That's, That's the it. motivation You're... I have. Woe is me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a victim. I don't yeah. want to do it. I wish I did want to do it, but I don't want to do it. And that's that. And what uh, Gene has uh, used this theory to, to help with is that you can control your motivation by controlling the activation of a context. So... And, this theory yeah, and, is about activating context. Yeah. Right. And it's and, and just to be clear, it's not that you just activate the right context. It's that you take seriously the fact that there are connections that are causing the motivation that you're having and that you need to understand that because there's a contradiction in there somewhere. And so yeah. you you take it seriously and you don't just it's something that you put in and it's something that you can change and reintegrate by new conscious judgments and, and conscious uh, evaluation. But this is distinct from the uh, older objectivist idea that uh, since your uh, emotions come from subconscious evaluations, if you change your evaluations, that will change the emotion. For instance, you think um, that guy is no good. And then you learn, oh, no, he is good, but you still have the emotion. I don't like that guy. And you can, you know, convince yourself that he is good and your uh, emotion was wrong and change that premise, right, uh, over a period of time. But this, that is a very um, abstract and somewhat misleading model. You're talking about something different, having yeah. to do with a network, not just a right. premise. A, an isolated evaluation. And can you explain that some more? Yeah, I'm going to try to say something short that, and hopefully not too, un, too, un, too confusing. So my view is that what really matters is the values and the clarity about the values and uh, also about threats. Basically, your emotions are, uh, some emotions are threat-based and some emotions are value-based. And if you can... In, get clear on the values at stake by at stake. I mean, your action right now is going to determine whether you get this value or not. And that's a subset of all your values because not everything is at stake at any given time. If you can get clear on that and go after the value, you can sort out these things. And in effect, you reintegrate your value hierarchy. And that's what you actually do to what used to be called changing premises, I think is actually straightening out your value hierarchy. And it's actually much easier if you try to do it in terms of changing premises, this is where you get 20 years of um, therapy that goes nowhere because it, it's, not at the, it's not at the intellectual level that the problem exists. It exists at the values level. It's the value structure that needs to be reorganized. Or at least that's my, that's my view. Yes, and the, um, this network that I showed, the, what's left out or not emphasized is that each of the nodes has a value charge. It's either for me or against me. And that's kind of the fuel for the whole operation of things moving into and out of consciousness. And it's not an isolate, usually not an isolated conclusion that you need to correct. It's that you need to establish a value context rather than 
what your mood is giving you or the resistance or whatever. And in pre preparation for this, uh, Gene and I talked about how you change a, an aversion or a fear or a bad mood into a good one. And I said, well, you don't want your, your view to sound like you go to your happy place. It's not that you take that magnet and turn it somewhere so you just don't see the bad stuff. So what was the formulation we came to instead of you go to your happy place? Right. You understand why you're having the emotion that you're having. And if it's, an, if it's a negative emotion, it's based on a threat, but a threat is a threat to a value. So you just need to analyze it further to understand what is the value that really matters to you that this emotion is trying to get you to be aware of. And if you can get all of the emotions uh, introspected to values, first of all, the emotional side calms down. And second, you can actually choose the biggest value. And sometimes that means, and, and that's just very different from, it's an analysis that you do. It's not just a turning of attention. It's an actual untangling of the value conflict. In that Excuse moment. me, Gene, if I may intervene here, but how does this translate to a fear which is not irrational, but let's say you don't control it, let's say spiders, hide, something like that. So of what threat to your values could be like horrible spiders be, which you might not have seen ever in your life, and yet you have a fear in your head. Well, so we need to take a real case, right? Because you can make up cases that are impossible to analyze. And, and phobias are actually one of the most mysterious cases, right? Because people don't understand why normally, they don't understand why they have that fear. So, but when it's triggered, my understanding of this is, when it's triggered, there is something that they are afraid of. And so the thing you need to introspect is why might I be feeling fear right now? And it could be about the spider, but for example, my understanding with phobias is it's usually a lack of control. And you learn to understand, well, what is, if, if it is take it a phobia, well, what is the lack of control I have here? Like, for example, I'm just going to make this up because I spent some time in a cottage and there were a lot of spiders. It's like, I can't keep this place clean. I need to have a place clean or else I won't be safe. And if you can get it to those words, you now say, ah, oh, it's cleanliness that I want. It's, or it's spaciousness that I want. And that is going to calm you down in that moment. Now, I'm not saying there's two separate issues. There's managing your motivation in the moment, which is something you can absolutely do with five minutes of work. And you can get focused on what is your top value at stake given what you know. And you, can, you may still feel a little uncomfortable. You may still feel a little bit of fear, but you will be able to take a step toward what you think the top value is. That's, that is a doable thing. That doesn't necessarily disintegrate some phobia or some old baggage that you have that keeps coming up, say from some bad experience you had as a child then you may need to do some other analysis because you have a pattern and you need to kind of un disentangle it uh, or untangle it wholesale. So that's another issue. So I don't know if this addressed your question, Nikos. Uh, oh, no, it was, uh, yes, it addressed it. Uh, that, that at the end of the day, there is always one value which is a threat. But as you said, with, let's say childhood fears, it needs, it, it, it's not, there's no like very easy answer on, oh, it's, it's these are right. the yeah. And this, why, this is why you can't just turn the magnet to some other place. You need to actually figure out what's going on. You need some introspective skills to understand what's going on right now in order to, to do that. And Thank what you. you're basically doing is getting clear on the full value context. That's what you're actually doing in that moment. Uh, there's a big shift in um, a tinge or nuance of objectivism here that is very important, and I'm just beginning to get my arms around it, with Gene leading me. Because <laughs> I, I often have my arms around Gene. <laughs> so uh, it is from the reason as pure, purely cognitive uh, viewpoint to the centrality and fundamentality and all pervasiveness of values and the emotions they produce even in uh, how consciousness functions. So we are, I mean, if you think of a dog, you don't, you wouldn't make this separation, right? You, you know that the dog is a 
sniffing, uh, yipping, uh, acting thing that whose consciousness is imbued and infused and only about moving him through the world to get stuff and avoid other stuff. And same for any a animal. Uh, but when it comes to human beings, because we can step back and think and ser be cerebral, uh, there's a tendency to think of reason as cold uh, calculation and the psychology is produced by pa facts and the premises are, are some of those facts. Uh, but Ayn Rand was not that way. Ayn Rand was violently, passionately emotional and violently, passionately intellectual. Uh, deeply, searingly intellectual and uh, famously uh, ecstatic or angry or uh, any emotion you want to name, uh, delighted, you know, uh, 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 outraged. So um, you have to look at your consciousness as a value pursuing thing. The purpose of consciousness is to keep you alive. So one thing that I realized is that Ayn Rand's immortal, indestructible robot who cannot be affected by anything that she uses to show the connection of value to life also applies to cognition. If a robot were not going to be affected by anything, it could not believe anything to be true. It could not distinguish between the way we can, between true and false or uh, contradictory and consistent would have no more significance for it than beginning with the letter C or not beginning with the letter C does for us. You don't file things by do they begin? You sure you could make that classification, but who would ever do that? And the robot doesn't care about anything, right? So it doesn't care whether something's contradictory or not. The reason we care is that contradictions will smack you in the face. It means that when you go this way, you're losing out from what's behind you. And if you go that way, you're losing out about what's in front of you. It's conflict, right? So the, the uh, view of consciousness itself and of cognition and concept formation and all these, you know, very abstract things has to be understood in a value base, a valuing basis. They're all means to get what you want in the world. So when I said to Gene, well, you're not just saying that to change your mood, you go to your happy place. What we both realize is, no, you go to reality. You go to, I'm a living being. I'm trying to get something. I'm, I want it. And I don't want that. that. That's bad. This is good. And what I have to do is get that powerful value mechanism in line with what I know about values in the world. I'm living, I'm acting, I'm doing. And that's what I, you know, I want to do and live and act in the way the world really is. Not my first kind of um, uh, first brush, first approximation, uh, snap judgment about the way the world is. But the way it really is, because that's where I live. So uh, that's a really big shift, I think, in objectivism. And there's actually a uh, set of former objectivists who take the opposite view and say that values are really secondary to cognition and uh, make a fact-value dichotomy. When would you signify the shift taking place, Leighton? Say that again. Yes. What did you say? When the shift the, in objectivism, you mean? Yes. Well, I think uh, it's, I, I was thinking of myself, but as I talk about it, um, Leonard Peikoff, in fact, in value, uh, made a, a new level of tight integration of fact and value. I knew that values were a kind of fact, 
but I still had a cere overly cerebral, uh, spectative view of knowledge. Um, Ayn Rand never had that. Ayn Rand, you know, this even in, you, this will shock you as it did me. Ayn Rand gave an interview with some magazine in 1935, I think it was, after We the Living came out, and they were asking her about her views and her opinions. And she said, I'm not interested in abstractions. I'm interested in real life. And what she meant was abstractions that don't relate to values, you know, to, to real life. Arified abstractions that she was, but I mean, that she could ever say anything remotely like that is really shocking. So uh, she was always um, the epitome of integration of passion and reason, thought and action. I'll give you an example, uh, another example from her. She died in 1982. March 6, 1982. In late 1981, of course, she didn't know that she was going to die soon, that she had, you know, a, a bad heart. In 1981, at the age of 76, which I happen to be myself now, she was planning to move to Hollywood, a place she detested. She really disliked Hollywood. And, you know, Los Angeles in general. Um, in order to make the miniseries of Atlas Shrugged, which she was going to produce herself. And uh, I was amazed because she rarely went out of her apartment. She was a real homebody. And uh, at, at 76, she, she wasn't, you know, creaky or anything, just like I'm not creaky at, at 76. Uh, but uh, she, I really was shocked that she was considering moving for a couple of years. She wasn't going to give up her, her home in, in New York, which she loved, because she wanted to see uh, Atlas Shrug brought to the screen, TV or otherwise, and she was going to raise the money herself, direct it herself, and she thought, I have to be there to do that. And so she was that was on her agenda. And she wrote, she was writing the screenplay when she died. The, yeah, the, the, the miniseries version of it. So, uh, action, you know, action, passion, emotion, values, and pure rational cognition were integrated in her to a phenomenal degree. My shift came, uh, I don't know, about, uh, I began when I thought, you know, shouldn't life versus death, this was in 2000, shouldn't life versus death, that alternative be part of epistemology, not just ethics? So that was like a seed. And then after that, in the last couple of years, it's been Gene. Gene has been stressing values and, and action because that's what her work is about. And she's uh, shown me the light there. So that's, that's when the shift occurred. And just for clarity, I thought when I started as a psychopistemologist that I was going to be entirely on the logical side. And the first things I taught were entirely logical skills. But what I found is that to manage your mind, I, I needed to deal with the emotional side. And I needed to understand that in more detail. And I think that this work toward on values, I don't think I'm the only person who's doing this. And uh, one other reference I saw, Rosie put the reference to fact and value there. There's an article in the, um, oh God, I'm going to forget the name of it, but the, uh, the, the technical book that Alan Godhelf and Greg Salmieri companion, edited. The companion. The companion. The companion. There are articles on values there that are really, really something worth, uh, worth reading. And, and I think have also advanced our knowledge of this. 
Uh, also, uh, to answer that, Nikos, uh, you know, it's not just in an objectivism that, that a kind of shift is happening. J.J. Uh, Gibson uh, stresses the role of action, and my old professor Richard Held in psychology stressed the role of action in cognition. Perception for Gibson is an achievement involving the motion of the organism through its environment in the pursuit of its goals, i.e. its value. And in um, pure philosophy, there are a couple of people writing about embodied consciousness. And uh, one of them that I like one book of is Alva Noe, and O with a diaresis, the two dots over the O, and an E. Maybe it's there over the E. Yeah, they have to be over the E. So you say no-E, not no. N-O-E, Alva. Um, the title of the book is has action in it, but I don't, uh, I'd have to get up and get around my green screen to find it. Um, Can I add one other? Source yeah, so there is, there is a, a movement outside of objectivism in this direction. Go ahead. And, and I think we should give Ed Locke a little bit of credit for that movement outside of objectivism, too, because, you know, he's he I mean, he is famous in psychology. He and his partners got goals into people's minds as important that you need to set goals in order to achieve things. And almost single handedly. I mean, this is now just accepted as a given in any self-help program or whatever. I mean, it's just. It's just a given, and it wasn't. That's that's Ed Locke's contribution to the future of Western civilization. So we should give Ed a little credit. And as a result of this, a lot of smart people, like I, I, I consider myself pretty smart, and I have a technical background. There are actually quite a few other, I mean, 10 people with technical backgrounds looking at psychology who have reached a number of interesting conclusions, very value-oriented. They don't have objectivism. That's my strength, is I have objectivism to actually explain it and make sense of it all. But there are quite a few people because they are goal oriented and they're trying to look at goals objectively are on a kind of value uh, premise. And that that's all in the last 20 years, I would say. And that's well, when you were saying this, I was thinking of even like self-help gurus. We, yes. It's been filtered down to that level. And I think it's good because there's a lot of bad things there. So it's good that these things were there. So shall we take some, uh, question so shall we go to joseph and then i'll go to adam because he hasn't spoke and if there's time then i'll get to lee since lee has already asked the question so joseph i really like the uh, uh the graph you showed with the magnet uh, i interacted recently with a person who was massively evading and i was thinking could you have some kind of graphical explanation of what evasion is you have any ideas? Yeah. I got an idea for that. What? Well, so at the risk of, uh, well, I'm just going to go out there. So I have recently coined a term anti-value with great trepidation because coining terms is very dangerous business. But I do think that in unusual cases, you can form what I'm calling an anti-value where you take a threat and you basically turn that threat into a bogeyman that you are terrified of. And it acts sort of like a value, like a values create all the different emotions in order to gain and keep that value and avoid threats. An anti-value creates tremendous aversion to getting anywhere near the thing that you think is so bad. And so it would be like a um, magnet with the opposite pole, basically blocking off, uh, basically preventing you from getting any access to some area of your knowledge. And I think that that is the motivational thing behind evasion. But is this threat a real or a not real threat? So I think once it becomes an anti-value, it is by definition irrational, meaning that it's when you turn it into a bogeyman, something that cannot be tolerated, that's not true. The only thing that you can't tolerate is death. And even death is you know, a fact of life that we need to accept. So it's the, it has been magnified by avoidance, and by uh, wrong, wrong conclusions and avoidance in particular, if you consistently avoid something, it becomes a bigger and bigger bogeyman that you're more and more afraid of. 
And this is why we've all had the experience of some task that we were absolutely dreading. And when you actually sat down to do it and you take one step and it's like, it's easy. It's like your fear of what it was going to be is so overblown compared to what the actual task is. That was created by means of avoidance. So just as a value becomes stronger when you act to gain and keep a value, it becomes stronger and stronger. Every action to gain and keep it makes it stronger. If you have something formed as an anti-value, every time you avoid it, that makes that stronger. It makes it a bigger, it makes it feel scarier and more awful. And uh, so that is always, I think, irrational. Here in the United States, we see this um, very, very starkly uh, in regard to Trump. Now, I voted for Hillary. I'm not going to vote for Trump for re-election. I despise the man. Uh, I think he's uh, irrational on steroids and uh, has wrecked the Republican Party and therefore the opposition. However, uh, I have friends who live and breathe to hate Trump. I mean, the, the left in America is so uh, crazed with Trump. Everything in, in, on CNN in America and MSNBC, it's nonstop attacks on, uh, uh, and, and hatred Every, for, for Trump. And that's an anti-value. Right. Everything is interpreted with respect to Trump, it's like, that's like the main thing, right? Yeah. That's, that's driving all the action, right? Yeah. And, uh, okay, so that's very, I, I don't know if you get that in England, uh, but you're probably aware of it going on the, in the United States. It's, uh, you, you have the feeling that if Trump loses after the initial celebration, they'll be disappointed because they won't have anything to uh, focus their hatred on. Yeah, there's even the term, I think, for this Trump derangement syndrome or something. Right. So, shall we go to Adam for the next live question? Adam, you are unmuted. Um, yes, it's more of an observation than a question. Uh, but I think there was a fundamental change in how uh, Americans first and then the rest of the world view the relationship between knowledge and the pursuit of values in the environment um, that is the actual intellectual cause of the global innovation industry uh, starting uh, with the software revolution that followed the internet. And that is, and it probably originated with Project Mac at MIT, the idea that uh, knowledge does not come before technology. Science does not come before technology. In order to develop knowledge, one must interact uh, in a goal-seeking way with the environment. That's technology. And it is essential for the growth of knowledge in all fields, but especially in new fields such as artificial intelligence, that uh, the technology gets developed uh, as an interaction with knowledge. And that has been a fundamental shift because in Ayn Rand's time, uh, it was viewed as a waterfall. Philosophy, then science, then technology, then production, um, then trade, then human life. But the realization has been um, since the MIT Project Mac, in fact. Uh, project uh, what, Adam? What project? Project Mac, M A C, Machine Assisted Cognition. Okay. Uh, the, uh, that in order to 
advance science in a fundamental way, one must have technology being developed in the same effort, in the same project, in the same mind. Well, that's very interesting because I'm writing a book on the philosophy of mathematics and my whole reason for writing it is to make mathematics subordinate to engineering. That, that pure mathematics is uh, no good, that mathematics exists to be applied. And rather than saying, uh, oh, there can't be any perfect mathematical circle in the world, we ought to say mathematics has an approximate grasp of real shapes in the world, but it simplifies them. For instance, the circle is, is inferior to real, the shapes of apples. That's the real thing, the shape of the apple. The circle is a, is a simplification for getting a grip on the apple, so to speak. So I'm in, I'm in that camp, too. And, and I didn't begin in that camp. <laughs> um, OK, thank you. Uh, Gene, do we have some um, points that we just have to get in that we? I, I think or, we've covered, um, unless you've got. Um... I think we've covered the points that we had on our list. And there are other questions. Does this, have we got time for one more question? Sure. So let's yeah. go to Simon. But since we haven't got much time, let's make the last question. That was going to be the last question. Well, we've got time. We've got time for more. Oh, OK. Sorry. I thought you have to leave at 50 past. At, at, at 4 o'clock. At 4. Oh, OK. OK, good. We have 12 more minutes then. Adam. No, you I think you mean Simon. I already, Simon. I already Simon. made my observation. Thank you, Adam. I like that. Uh, well, if I can ask, ask my question, thank you, Harry, and thank you, Gene, okay. for tonight. You're raising it, uh, an area which feeds into my own business. I'm a therapist, a cognitive hypnotherapist. Most of the people that come into my office have some kind of trauma, uh, whether it's uh, they have a, an idea in their head which is causing them to be particularly uh, anxious. For instance, I might have a guy who uh, is straight and is worried that he's gay, and that idea in his head just burns and burns away. Or I might have a guy with tinnitus. Most of us, I suspect, have some tinnitus. Uh, but he's so aware of it that it's driving him nuts. So that might be a client. Uh, another client, you know, a, a client who had a, a, the image of himself cutting. That was an unacceptable image for him to have as a thought. And it's changed the weight of that connection in his head to, to such a strong weight that almost any experience that he might have, that thought is now coming to mind. He might see a pair of scissors and all of a sudden he's in the panic for seven hours that he might cut himself, for instance. Um, I raised my hand before Jean talked about anti-value, so I apologize if you're going to give me the same question, the answer, the same answer, Jean. But I'm wondering if I have certain smoke and mirrors to help my clients as a, as a cognitive hypnotherapist. But I'm wondering if you have something other than going through a long or five or six sessions trying to get them to integrate their values. You know, they've already walked out by that point. I'm afraid I I, I have to help my clients much more quickly than that. I wonder if you have any tricks, Harry, to reduce the weighting on those connections so that they just don't care about some of those things anymore. Well, that's Jean's area. So, Thank you. Yeah, so, so a couple things. One, so I'm not a therapist, right? So I, I have a degree in psychology, but it was experimental psychology. So just, just to be totally clear, you probably do have things that can help people in the moment much more than I could for something like that. The way that I would understand that, I, I just have two things. One is I do think, I, I do think understanding it as anti-values instead of as wrong premises is really helpful, because the way that you dissolve anti-values is by uh, the the methods of seeing it's really not as bad as you thought it was, okay. and that reality really does help. And that's something you can do in small incremental steps. Now, not that it can be done in in one step. I think that if if you really have formed something like this where it's a real um, something is really disorganized 
and it's and it's integrated in the wrong way, it's going to take some time to just to, 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 to reorganize that. But I do think uh, that you can do things in the short term, and it sounds like you have some techniques to help in the short term. And one of the things that I found, there's a woman named Brooke Castillo, who has a program called Self-Coaching Scholars that uh, she has something that has been very helpful. It basically takes on the cognitive approach and she calls it the self-coaching model. It's, and what you do is in the moment, you see what that thought is and you see how that thought that you're focusing on in the circumstances is causing a particular feeling, which is then motivating particular action, which is then creating a vicious cycle. And if you can see that, that gives you a certain objectivity on it. And I think that in itself is helpful. The, the thing that I add to that is seeing that there are about half the emotions are threat-based and about half of them are, are value-based. So like a threat-based emotion would be fear that this is a threat to me or aversion. This is a bad thing. I need to stay away or guilt. I've been bad or anger. This person is harming me. Whereas um, value-based emotions, love, this is a value. Joy, I've gained a value. Grief, I've lost a value. That's, it, it's negative, but it's a value-based emotion. Um, uh, pride, value-based. The, the, the emotions that are threat-based set up vicious cycles. So I think grasping that you are in a threat-based loop and seeing that what you need to do is you need to find out what are the values at stake because Threats are not the fundamental. I mean, I think if you look at like people's reaction to the COVID, very fear-based, right? What you, and, and people were just ignoring the fact that actually we need to keep the production system running so that we can maintain our standard of living. And you know, they just dropped that whole context. If you can see that you're in that threat-based context and say, okay, well, what is the value at stake? There's some there's some value, a threat is a threat to a value, so you could, this takes a little more analysis to get to that. And then what are the other values at stake? That can help you kind of in the moment. And I said, I said in like a five minute type process, I mean, that's with some skill, you can actually see what is the value at stake for me right now. And when you see that clearly, and, you, and you're in touch with your emotions, which is another thing you learn from therapists, because a lot of people who have these things just, they aren't in touch with their feelings at all. I think. To be aware of the values at stake, you need to be emotionally self-aware. And when you are emotionally self-aware of the values at stake, then you actually get some genuine motivation to go for the thing that is best for you. And that's the thing that I think you can do in the short term. And of course, every time you do that, you're building up the value and you are dissolving the anti-value just by taking an action toward a genuine value. And so it can give you a means of taking a step forward in a constructive way at this moment and, and the reason I mention hers is that her little method of doing this is very quick. And it's, uh, it's um, I mean, it's consistent with like 18 other things when you see it, but she's really packaged it up in a way that you can just use it and you can really, I'm not gonna say you can turn on a dime, but you can really, in a short amount of time, you can kind of reorient yourself. But it has uh, to do with, it has to do with, um, taking seriously what's going on in your mind and realizing you have the choice to agree with the, the whisperings of this or the shouts of the subconscious or not, right? And owning it, right? So a big th thing people learn in therapy is to not hate themselves for having the feelings that they have, right? Yeah. And that's part of this is you need to own the fact, yes, I am having this reaction. My present value hierarchy and my present state this is the reaction I'm having, and that's okay, because I can go after my values in this context. And that, uh, one of the things I like to say is I think self-esteem is an action. That when you, when you are willing to take the moment to see what is in my self-interest here, that is an act of esteeming yourself and taking a step toward what you think is best for you right now is an act of esteeming yourself. And it's, I, I don't think it's the case that you have some self-esteem. This is, I, I'm not a Brandon fan. I don't think it's you have self-esteem and that determines how you act. I think it's your action toward values is what uh, embodies that. And it's an action you take for yourself and that you can do, even if your psychology is uh, a little messed up. So it's, it's, just, it's, it's like uh, Peter Keating says, why do they think it's easy to do what you want? It's the hardest thing. 
to do what you really, really want. And um, another way of talking about values is what do you really want in the full scope of your life? Um, I'd like to answer another question that that gives rise to. Uh, well, can from, I just see if, if this kind of addressed what Simon was asking for? Yes, that'd be better. Uh, well, thank you, Jean. I, I think it does. I'll, I'll take a look at um, the resource that you mentioned. Um, I think if people can be value focused, that kind of method will help. But I think a lot of my clients are virtually have a, have a VR helmet on their head and it's, mm -hmm. they're just running through thoughts about the, 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 the mugging they just had and things like mm -hmm. that. And so they, they aren't actually aren't in contact with reality and uh, uh -huh. for them getting them to realize that they're thinking and forgetting their thinking is really helpful because they're I just like, running a clip. I can rec recommend another author who deals with obsessive compulsive disorder in that way. And his name is Jeffrey Schwartz. And I like to recommend him because he's one of the very, very, very few psychologists who believes in free will. And he it says that the, he trains his patients to deal with the thoughts that they have with their volition. And I, I think it would be um, helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And I do think, I mean, like PTSD and these kinds of things, I mean, these are kind of specialized issues. I think that they can be integrated with this theory, but I, I think you need specialized help for this kind of thing. Totally agree with that. I want to get to Ella's question. How does the triggering mechanism favor long-term versus short-term goal? Is it different from person to person? Uh, Ella, are you there and can you clarify? Are you, are you, it sounds like you're asking, do triggers only work on short-term goals? I think I, I get a question there. Um, how does the triggering mechanism work for long-term and short-term goals? Well, long-term goals are bigger, right? I mean, generally, like your long-term goal is, let's say, to make uh, Howard Rock's long-term goal, to, to make uh, big, beautiful buildings. His short-term goal is to find a better contractor than the one he has now, okay? So the short-term goal is a means to the long-term goal. So by definition, the long-term goal is more powerful. Now, maybe if you've got a, 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 some kind of dichotomy going, long-term goals are really just aspirations. Oh, gosh, I'd like to be a writer. Yeah, I'd like to be an real. architect. Huh? Making them real is sometimes the challenge, right? Yeah. So that they have an seeing, emotional pull. That actually takes work. And seeing the short-term goal as a step to the long-term goal, that's a volitionally, um, that volition can work on. So one of the questions you ask is, well, why do I want this short-term goal? Well, because I have to do this to get that. And I really, really want that. So the long-term goals, the triggers to the long-term goals would normally be stronger than the trigger to short-term goals. If but, you've organized your value hierarchy. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is, this is after having done work, like, like if you develop a career interest, it takes work. You have to act to gain and keep it so that you become interested in it, so you develop knowledge on it so that that becomes a big value in your psychology and it has a lot of emotional pull. But just saying, oh, my long-term goal is to make a million dollars, nothing is gonna happen. I mean, all you're gonna get is a little bit of guilt when you don't do any work to try to make it. You aren't gonna have any pull forward until you actually tie it around to a lot of other values and a lot of other actions. Yeah, and there's, a, there's another thing that I wanted to point out that integrates with the Crow epistemology here, which is uh, life is lived in the concrete. So if you decide, you know, I want to be a composer, uh, but I'm working for an ad agency and I'm, I'm got deadlines and they want this and they want that. And I, I don't have time. I want to be a composer. 
that is a, a floating abstraction, and it would be concretized by, for instance, what is one step I could take today to start down the path to being a composer, even though I've got a deadline in the ads? Or what is one thing I could do today? Well, I could write down a list of the composers that I admire. I mean, that just came to me, you know. Uh, and then that gives you certain information and that prepares you for the next step. What, what can I do? That, well, I could obviously spend some time listening to these composers and seeing what it is that I like about what they do and why I don't like other. So let me take the first one here. And let me, um, tomorrow I'll get the uh, first uh, concerto of Rachmaninoff and I'll contrast it to the first concerto of Beethoven and see why I like one and not crazy about the other. Uh, and so you've made that decision. That's one step, right? And through a series of small steps, you do act for what you gain and are keep because the mind can't deal with a million steps at once and a long journey, you know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And the breaking the down, uh, uh, to one more story, breaking it down is essential. When I was writing my doctoral dissertation, every morning I would wake up with this big black thing, cloud hanging over me. I've got to do the dissertation today. And no matter how many times I corrected that, it still came back. The solution was, I don't have to write the dissertation today. I have to write the next paragraph. Where did I leave off? Oh, yeah, I made this point and that point. But of course, then I wanted to make the next point, which would be so-and-so. And that's fine. You know, I could do that. But when it, if I didn't break it down, into manageable bits. You know, oh, I've got to write the dissertation today. My motivation was all against it. So values have means, yes, have steps, and you take one small step for yourself. Mankind doesn't care. Right. So I think it's time to wrap it up. Uh, I, I'll let Raj do the outro since he organized this great event. Just say a huge thank you to Harry. You can follow his work, among other places, in the Harry Binswager uh, newsletter. Uh, sorry, the letter. Letter. I have I have the Harry Binswager letter, and I have the link in the chat. And also, you can follow. Gene's work at uh, Thinking Directions, which I'll also post on the chat. And also to support Raz in the great uh, work he's doing, bringing speakers of such high status and such high level, you can consider becoming members of and supporters of the Ayn Rand Center UK. Raz, do you want to do the outro? Yeah, so thank you, Nikos, and thank you, uh, Gene and Harry. I I, uh, I think that, you know, the more people see uh, today's talk, you know, we, we, we're all going to benefit. So if you share that view, I strongly urge everybody here uh, to, to share this event. It's on Facebook now. You can already share it. Um, it'll be on YouTube. I put the, the, the link to our uh, YouTube channel in the Zoom chat. Uh, it'll be on, on YouTube and on uh, the podcast platforms in the next few days. So, yeah, that, that would be very helpful. Um, and next week, next Monday, we have um, a talk, on, uh, actually a panel discussion on human rights in the Middle East. Uh, we have a few speakers that are yet to be confirmed. The one who is confirmed is Ilan Giorno, who wrote a, a book on um, Israel and, and uh, how America should approach uh, that conflict. Uh, so yeah. Oh, and this Wednesday, our discussion of the metaphysical versus the man-made with that's not live on Facebook. So if you want to join that, you have to be on the London Ayn Rand meetup. Um, and, and it'll be posted also too at some point. So thanks again, everybody. And see you soon. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.